All right, Ben. I'm so excited to have you on the show. You have some great content out there. You are helping people change their life one step at a time. And now I get to have you on my podcast. Oh, I'm excited to be here with you, Connie. We're going to have a blast today. Uh, so you have a whole plethora of information available on the internet, on your social media outlets, uh, YouTube, you name it. You have amazing individuals on your podcast talking about all sorts of things uh, about the metabolic system, as well as weight loss, mindset, you name it. And so what kind of got you into this? How did you get started? And uh, what fuels your fire for this? Yeah, thank you for that introduction. So, I mean, somebody looks at me today and they see a healthy man, a lean man, but the truth of it is that for most of my life, I was very much unhealthy. Uh, I was growing up here in Miami Beach, Florida, left to my own devices, ate a standard American diet, AKA a stupid American diet. And I was obese, actually. I was obese physically and mentally. And I was hanging around the wrong crowd, thinking toxic thoughts, stinking thinking. And I found myself at the age of 24 years old, back in 2008, being a 250 man who is obese, depressed, suicidal, lost in life, never had any goals or aspirations. And I wanted to give up on life. I was actually exploring ways to end my life because I was tired of being depressed and hurting. And anytime I did that, I would think about my mother. Of course, I would think about the devastation she would have to deal with. And I loved her too much to to do that to her. So it stopped me from pursuing that, thank God. And I knew I had to figure things out. I didn't know where to start, but I knew that it had to start with my health because I didn't have any energy. I was 24 years old, but I felt like I was 94 years old. I would have to take naps throughout the day. I was addicted to carbohydrates and sugar and video games and drugs. So I started to read books for the first time ever, besides being forced to read in school. I started to read books from authors like uh, Wayne Dyer and Bob Proctor and Lisa Nichols and Earl Nightingale. And it really just helped me hear their challenges and how they overcome their hurdles. And it helped me actually take ownership over my results and my health for the first time ever, because up until that point, I was playing the victim card. I was blaming everyone and everything, my metabolism, my genetics, my enabling family members. But I stopped all that. The moment I started to really read books and it empowered me to be the victor of my future and stop being the victim of my past. So I put my foot down and I said, all right, I am responsible. Um, and responsibility is huge. And what it is, is just your ability to respond is being responsible. So I said, I'm going to be responsible here and I'm going to start eating better. I'm going to start exercising and I'm going to take ownership over my results. So fast forward nine months after that, Connie, I went from being 250 pounds on that day one to down to 170 pounds. I went from 34% body fat down to 6% body fat, a size 38 waist to size 30. So I finally had carved out this, this physical six pack, if you will. But the most important thing I, I, I achieved during that transformation was a mental six pack. I started to think better thoughts. I started to do better things with my life. I started to cut toxic people out of my life. I became a personal trainer and a CrossFit owner and then a certified health coach. And, you know, fast forward to today, about 12 years later, I have three books that are all bestsellers. I have a very popular YouTube channel, a, a top podcast, and my company Keto Camp, which the mission is to educate and to inspire 1 billion people to get this information to them, to help them be empowered, to help them understand that there's no pill, no surgery, no supplement that could replace what we have within us already, which is this innate intelligence. And all we have to do is three things. Number one, identify interference. Number two, remove interference. And then number three, just allow your body to heal. So that's the message that we preach at Keto Camp. And that's why I'm excited to be with you today. Boy, that's such a great story. I know for myself, it was kind of a similar thing. I was never up I was up to about 200 pounds at the high, at the lowest point in my life at my highest weight. And I, I think people don't realize when they look at us now that we overcame these really large challenges. And it's so crazy how all of these things kind of go hand in hand, depression, obesity, um, all of that stuff, food. And I've found so much food and mood is like a huge thing uh, with my own personal clients. And so it's amazing that you made these discoveries. And I also love hearing that you took ownership of this uh, because I find that's another really large thing. I think society and people in general have a 
have a way of blaming things on other people. And it's really hard until they kind of reflect on all sorts of things for them to realize that the person that's in control of their destiny is entirely them. Amen. Yeah, well said. And you know, that's, it's, it's so empowering when you understand that because it really, it's, it's almost impossible to actually say those words, I am responsible and still feel angry and resentful. It's empowering to do that. And I know everybody has different circumstances and situations, but we manifest our reality. And a lot of people are searching for things like happiness. Like, how do I be more happy? Well, the truth is, there is no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. It's an inside job. And it starts with those 60,000 thoughts that we have every single day. If we could get really good at choosing better thoughts, we change our thoughts and then we change our life. And that's what I've done for myself. And I still continue to work on it for myself. Yeah, it seems that it's always a work in progress. I know every once in a while, uh, I, I don't know if you've heard of Jocko Willink, but he's a, yeah. a major, wonderful speaker. And he's a big proponent of owning your own circumstances. And I know that every once in a while, I'll be like, well, I was late because of this and that. And my husband will be like, oh yeah. <laughs> He'll be like, whose fault was it really? <laughs> like, So he keeps me in check because we're both huge Jocko fans and, and and, you know, we're both constantly working on, uh, you know, being in control of our, our situation, even sometimes if the situation is not ideal. I love that. So, uh, you know, that's the victor mentality versus the, uh, the victim mentality. And the truth is only about 3% of the population have that mentality, meaning only 3% of the population actually get the results they want. They live a happy life to make a big impact which is sad when you think about it, because that means 97% of people are not living on purpose with their purpose. They don't know what their purpose is. They are, you know, choosing a pill or a surgery or, or a vaccination or something that could not even replace what they have within it, within them, which is their, their innate intelligence. So I, I love that you and your husband do that. I acknowledge both of you for doing that. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of funny when, you know, one of us shuts the other one down, right? Cause we're like, <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I guess you're right. Darn it. <laughs> Rats, you're holding me accountable for this, but I kind of secretly hate you for it. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was, uh, la for January last month, me and my girlfriend, Natasha, we did, we decided to go no sugar, like no extra sugar, unless it's from fruit. And, uh, we were walking to dinner and I, I remember I was recording an Instagram story and then she was like, Oh, you know, but we can't have sugar at dinner or dairy or dairy. And I'm like, well, we can, but we choose not to. And she didn't like that, but then she realized that's true. We were choosing not to. You know, I find it interesting that you say that then, because it's kind of like when you go out to dinner with your friends and you've started this new nutrition lifestyle and they're like, Hey, do you want to have a cookie? And you're like, no, I don't want to eat that cookie. And uh, they're like, why you can't have a cookie? And I'm like, no, I can have a cookie. I just recognize that it's not probably going to do me any good in the end. And so it's something that I'm trying to avoid. If I want to eat the cookie, I'll eat the cookie. But really, is it something that's going to get me closer to my health and fitness goals? Probably not. Exactly. Yeah, it's a great question to ask yourself. I love that you do that. Yeah. And there's a big argument out there in the, in the macro accounting community, right? Where they're like, well, you, you can't, nothing's off limits and, and blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, is I think that you, if you become somebody that constantly makes compromises to your own goals, then you are totally going to compromise yourself back into a hole because you're going to start making compromises all over the board. So you kind of have to have some solids in your life. You're right, Connie. Yeah, you could justify just about anything. And yeah, do calories matter? Of course they do. But are they important? Uh, no, I don't believe they are. They are more of a distraction. Because if you want to lose weight, for example, you don't lose weight to get healthy, you get healthy to lose weight. And if you're focusing on macro tracking and calorie counting, then you're focusing on losing weight to get healthy. That's not how it works. Yes, you might get some short term results and you might feel like this is working for you. But overall, what you're doing to your metabolism is not good. And you're going to actually get those that weight back on. And then you're going to be more frustrated thinking that it was you blaming you going even more strict when the reality is that the, the protocol was wrong. You know, you're not focusing on the hormones. You're not focusing on your metabolism. That's what's really important. 
I love that you say that. And I love that you say those two words, hormones and metabolism, because that's something that comes up so frequently. It's just calories in calories out. And, and that's not just the case when you have so much going on with hormones and metabolism. So uh, with that being said, do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? And also what, what kind of nutrition modality did your journey kind of start out as, and how did you discover what you are into doing now? Yeah. I'll answer the last question first, and then I'll go back to the calorie in calories in versus calories out. So the way I lost the weight was actually not the way that I would teach it today. I was actually focused on the calories in versus calories out. I was focused more on low fat and eating every two to three hours. And yes, I lost the weight, but here's a lesson that I learned. I was one of those fit, sick people. I had digestive issues. I had acne, but I had a six pack, right? But that didn't really equate to, to true health. So I was curious on how I could feel better, how I could prevent napping all the time and my skin issues and gut issues. So I, you know, explored different avenues. I, I, I did the vegan diet, a plant-based diet, a hundred percent plant-based diet for a year and a half. And I learned from that because I was dogmatic about it. I was fooled by bad research. I didn't know how to read research. So yeah, the vegan approach worked for me short term. I felt better. I was eating more plants, more fruits. But then I hit this vegan wall where I know it wasn't working for me, but I stuck with it because I was dogmatic about it. So then after the vegan approach, after I said, all right, enough is enough. I don't feel good on this. I did lab work. It, it verified what I was feeling. I transitioned actually to keto and, and intermittent fasting. And that was back in 2013. And if you think about it, a keto approach typically is the exact opposite of a vegan approach. You're eating more animal fats, animal protein. And I did a complete 180 and I felt a lot better. I was doing CrossFit at that time. I owned my gym back then and my workouts were better. My performance was better. My hormones were, were better. So I realized that health is really about hormones and cells, you know, hormones and cells. And if you could actually get your hormones to be more sensitive, meaning getting their job to be more efficient at communicating with your cells, you're going to burn more fat. You're going to produce more energy. You're going to feel better. And I wasn't able to do that with calorie counting. I was not able to do that with low fat or even the vegan approach, but I am able to do it now with a, what I call a keto flex approach and an intermittent fasting approach. So the reason calories in versus calories out doesn't work. Well, there's many, many reasons, but one example is this. I mean, the TV show, the perfect, the, the biggest loser. Do you remember that TV show? Oh yeah. The biggest loser. Right. So they had these obese contestants. They were morbidly obese. And then Jillian Michaels and Bob Harper, or whatever his name is, and the, these trainers put them on this extreme calories in versus calories out approach. So they cut their calories, they increased their exercise. And what happened? They had an amazing transformations. They documented it. They celebrated them. The season ended and everything looked fine and dandy until months later, years later, just about every single one of those contestants gained the weight back plus more. And the worst thing about it is that they destroyed their metabolism. And they even had to sign clauses that said they can't speak about this in public. That's why there's never a Biggest Loser reunion show because they gained the weight back. Um, another example is if you just ate 500 calories every day of a salad with salmon, and then you compare that to eating 500 calories every single day of like brownies, same amount of calories, totally different response. If you're eating the salad with the salmon, you're going to feel better. You're going to lose weight. Your hormones will be better. If you're eating just the brownies, you're going to have wonky hormones. You're going to not be able to lose the weight you want. You're going to feel like crap, but it's the same 500 calories. That's why it's a huge distraction. We want to focus on quality over quantity. So I think it's doing the person a big disservice when you're just having them cut the calories and exercise more and putting them into a deficit because it just leads them towards long-term frustration and failure. And they feel like they're the failure, but the approach was the actual failure. Oh, I mean, I'm into all of this, like 100%. And I kind of compare it to this. And if somebody sits and thinks about it, it's kind of deep. If you take 200 calories of rice cakes, and then you take 200 calories of hard boiled eggs, you eat one, which is the rice cakes, you are going to be hungry still. You're not going to be satiated. You're going to want to eat whatever else is around you. If you eat 200 calories worth of hard boiled eggs, you're not going to be hungry immediately. It's going to take longer to digest. There's more of a thermic effect. There's a lot of factors involved that completely separate it from just being a calorie in. 
Great example. Exactly. You have the protein, which, which stimulates uh, different hormones like cholecystokinin, peptide YY. You're going to be full, but with the rice cake, you don't get any of that same calories, different response. You're so right. So let's talk about this a little. I really liked what you said back there. I might have to steal it. Uh, your keto flex approach. Now I've yeah. heard you bring up fruit. I've heard you bring up this approach. And this is something that I love hearing because I think I think I've earned myself the reputation of being this keto coach or something. And I'm not, I'm absolutely not a keto coach. Uh, but I am a believer that everybody should try it for a period of time. And I think the reason for that is, is we, from the moment we are born are being filled with these carbohydrates. I mean, the first thing we start to eat when we're a baby is rice, cereal and fruits, pure, you know, pureed fruits and all of these things. And when our, we're kids, we're getting Gatorade at our soccer games and graham crackers and you just name it. And that is very typical of the, I, I would just say the American diet, but it's really the, a lot in the world. So, uh, and I, and I think our bodies never have this time to make a switch to kind of understanding how to use bo both fuel sources. So I think for a period of time, it is important for everyone to take a step back, incorporate some fasting and remove carbs from their diet, even if it's just a temporary thing. Yeah. Well said, you know, when you look at Keto. Keto is very popular nowadays. You could go on Dr. Google and type in what is the keto diet. You'll get over 200 million results. So the good thing about keto being so popular is that a lot of people are getting this information. The bad news is that a lot of the information out there is still focusing on losing weight to get healthy, not healthy, getting healthy to lose weight. So the truth about keto is this. Keto is not a diet. Keto is a metabolic process and it's been around since humans have existed. So when somebody says, oh, that's just a fad, it's a trend regarding keto or even fasting. No, it's not. It's a fact. It's not new. It's just more nuanced. So when you look at a baby, like to your point, a baby that's born into this world is a natural fat burner because burning fat is our primal birthright. Every single one of our ancestors did keto. On the same token, they also got out of ketosis when they had the opportunity. So we'll, we'll get back to that shortly. But if you look at a baby, a baby that is breastfed, breast milk has saturated fat, has cholesterol, and the baby actually goes in and out of ketosis when they're getting breast milk. And that actually helps the development of the baby's brain, which we know the brain is mostly fat. That's a perfect example of how we're designed to burn fat. But then what happens, like you said, Connie, we take this natural fat burning baby, we wean it off um, breast milk, and then we actually give it these purees and baby foods and carbohydrates and sugar, a standard American diet, and it's all across the world. And then we teach this fat burning baby to be a sugar burner, and then it's stuck as a sugar burner. And here's the problem with that. Our 70 trillion cells in the body only could burn two options for fuel. Either we're burning fat and, and producing ketones like a natural baby would, or we're burning sugar in the form of glucose. Now, here's the analogy that I like to give. When our cells are burning glucose, which is a toxic fuel source, I compare that to a, a truck, right? A truck that's speeding through the highway with all the smoke that's now spewing out of the exhaust pipe. It's going on this car, that car, on the trees, on the road. It's very toxic for the environment. When the cells are burning glucose and stuck as sugar burners, it creates a lot of cellular smoke, cellular byproducts, and it's very toxic for the cellular environment. Now, if we could teach the body and the cells to now transition and be a fat burner and produce ketones, that's like a Tesla that's cruising through the highway, much safer and healthier for the surrounding environment, much healthier for your cellular environment. That's what keto can do. But also, just like you said, I think it's great to do it, to teach your cells to burn fat, to reset your fat burning hormones, but not to stay in it forever because our ancestors didn't do that either. So the way that I teach it is called Keto Flex. And I have a new book coming out all about this very, very soon. We're, we're very strict short term. We're dropping the carbs, increasing the healthy fat and protein. We're getting into ketosis. We're teaching the cells to burn fat. And then once you've done the work, like you've done, Connie, then you can start flexing in and out. And how many times you do it, of course, is based off of your goals and your health history. But once a week, twice a week, seven times a month, something like that, but you start flexing in and out and that's metabolic flexibility and freedom. And I believe that's how we could thrive.
And let me tell you, when you start getting to that point of where you can go in and out of ketosis or burn both fuels at the same time, it's a mind blowing thing. I know, um, I have recently in the last year gotten into competitive endurance cycling and being able to use both fuels has been a huge game changer for me. I can do a 10 hour race and not have to touch any kind of fuel at all because my body is so well adapted. And then the other crazy thing is, is I think that it is so adapted that when I do pull in carbohydrates, it's funny, I stay in ketosis to a reasonable degree because my body is doing both things at the same time, because it knows that it can go to both of those sources. So it's been a really fun journey as far as learning all of that portion of things, because the body is an amazing thing. And when you start using two different fuels as a source, it's a pretty awesome thing. (laughs) It's very awesome. Yeah. And that's, that's what it's about. It's about having that metabolic freedom. You know, it's really like a, a, a burden off your shoulders because we could get our calories from the plate of food in front of us, or we could get our calories from our butt, our hips and our thighs. And when you have the metabolic freedom and flexibility, you could do that. Like you just said, you're able to do and train and race and you're, you are feeding off your body fat. And that's the reason we have body fat. So many people who are sugar burners, they don't have this capability. They are metabolically broken in a sense, and they cannot, they burn through their sugar reserves and then they can't tap into their fat stores and they feel miserable. That's what we don't want. So they're hangry. They can't focus. They need to get carbs just to focus and they're stuck on this roller coaster. So when you're fat adapted and metabolically flexible, you can go hours, you can go days without food and you can be totally fine. Yeah. And I love that you say that. And it brings a a kind of a thought to my mind. And I know you've probably seen it too. How many people have you seen doing hours of cardio and eating a thousand calories a day, yet they can't lose that visceral fat that like, just like you said, from your butt, your hips, your thighs, you, they can't lose it. And they're like, I don't know. I've tried everything for weight loss and I just can't get there. And that I, in my belief is because their body doesn't know how to burn its own fat. It's stuck as a sugar burner. <laughs> that's exactly true. And that's where the calories in versus calories out thing does them a huge disservice because it's a distraction to their metabolism. It's a tr- distraction to what's going on with the hormones. And that's why, you know, the message that we preach is so important because it helps them break through and then understand how the body works at a cellular level. And once you understand that, it's so empowering because you know what to do. You know that it's quality, not quantity. Absolutely. So what's kind of going the fasting direction now? Because I know that a part of this, and I would love to hear your take on it, um, fasting has become a big thing, but I can't tell you how many people have come to me and they're like, oh, I'm so hungry. I tried fasting. I just can't be hungry that long. And I think part of that is because there's kind of some poor information getting spread out on the internet saying, hey, start fasting, start doing this 16-8 window or do this. But people are doing that before they ever teach their body how to use its own fuel source. So then they end up not being able to follow through with their intentions because their body is screaming at them in panic. That's exactly it. Exactly. So that's why it's important the way I teach it. So I have four pillars in my keto flex book that I teach. Number one, the first pillar is adapt, getting keto adapted, getting fat adapted, getting into ketosis. Number two, fast. Then we practice intermittent fasting because you have the amount, the metabolic flexibility to go in and out through your sugar reserves and fat stores and et cetera. Number three, we phase. So we do a little bit of some carnivore where we phase out all carbohydrates short term. And then number four, we start flexing. So the reason somebody blames fasting, like you said, is because fasting is a muscle. And if you don't develop that muscle and you just go right into it, it's going to look ugly. Just like if you were a sugar burner or a couch potato, excuse me, for 10 years, and then you heard about CrossFit and you said, oh, CrossFit sounds wonderful. You go do a CrossFit workout. It's going to look ugly. You got to train for that workout. You got to train for that marathon. So that's where keto comes into play. It helps train that fasting muscle then you have that metabolic flexibility. So when you do practice fasting, you burn through your glycogen stores, you burn through your sugar reserves, but now you have the capability of making that switch into your fat stores. And then you feel great. And then you're thinking fasting is wonderful. Fasting is incredible because you've done it the right way. But when you go into it too soon, you'll burn through your sugar reserves. Then you can't make the switch to your fat stores and the brain panics and it sends the body intense signals for carbohydrates, 
for sugar to get that glucose spike. And even if you have the best willpower in the world, it'll start to break down protein. It'll convert that protein to glucose via gluconeogenesis, and you won't get the results you want. Absolutely. I tell people that when it comes to food, the brain is such a powerful thing. And being a former bodybuilding athlete and getting stage lean multiple times, I can tell you the brain is crazy and it doesn't want women's bodies to be that lean. And it's so weird. I I am the most disciplined person with the most willpower ever out there. But it's funny when you're walking by a plate, your hand will reach out for something, even though you told it no. So (laughs) it's kind of a crazy feeling. And I tell people that I'm like, listen, the brain is a powerful tool and being able to shut that off can be a really hard thing sometime to change habits. Yeah. The brain is a fickle beast and, uh, you're, you're so right. Um, if you go against your physiology, uh, you know, it's the body will get the last laugh. Mother nature, God will get the last laugh. We're not designed to go against our physiology. So that's an interesting share about, how you told yourself you're not going to eat that bread or whatever, but your body just goes and grabs it. It's very fascinating. It was insane. And there were so many times where I'd find myself, my hand would just, I'd be meal prepping for my family and my hand would just reach out into the the pan of whatever it was I was cooking. And it would be headed towards my mouth. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? Get, you know, get off of here. I don't even know what's happening right now. And it, it's just kind of crazy, uh, uh, you know? So I, I tell people that it, the brain is a powerful thing and it does take a lot to retrain it, especially when it comes to food. I can't tell you how many clients, I, this just happened to me recently where I did a 30 day challenge and part of the challenge was to eliminate sugar And my one client said that he had like suicidal thoughts after getting rid of sugar. Yeah. And he said he was in such a dark place that he called his psychiatrist and was like, I don't know what's going on. Why am I all of a sudden so depressed? And it was like, wow, just from removing sugar. Of course, once he told me, I was like, okay, listen, we're going to take this down a little slower. You don't have to just jump in all, you know, and we fixed it and it was fine. And after a couple of weeks, he was like, I feel so good. (laughs) But getting there after years and years of sugar abuse was a really difficult thing for him. And his brain played tricks on him. Yeah, that's crazy. You know, the the same part of the brain that lights up when somebody experiences a cocaine addiction is the same part of the brain that lights up when somebody experiences a uh, sugar addiction. It's the same region of the brain showing you how powerful, how addicting carbohydrates and sugar is. And, And I say carbohydrates and sugar because carbohydrates, all carbohydrates turn into sugar in the body. A lot of people think, oh, but I'm, I don't eat sugar. I just have my whole grain wheat bread. I have my oatmeal. I have my, that turns into sugar in the body. It just takes a little bit longer, but it still turns into sugar in the body. Amen. I've heard that so many times I got rid of sugar. I only eat this and that. And it's like, Oh, well that's all sugar too. Apples are sugar. Uh, so yeah, it, it was a, and it was a great learning experience for me too, because I think that, you expect people just to be able to, to give something up. Right. And, uh, uh, it wasn't the case for him. And it's a really hard balance, I think too, because your brain does kind of trick you into making those compromises sometimes too. So you don't want to be like, Oh, it's okay. We'll wean down. Uh, we'll do this. But you know, at one point mental health becomes a big part of it with that addiction factor. So it was something we had to tread very carefully on. So with that being said, um, I'm sure that you have learned some things about mental health as well in this journey. I have. Yeah. And you know, I believe you got to exercise before you exercise. A lot of people who are doing keto fasting, whatever, paleo veganism, they don't get the results they want because they have toxic thoughts towards themselves themselves because you you cannot really heal a body that hates itself and you cannot heal a body that has hate so when you know i've done a lot of inner work on myself over the years i believe there are two tools that we have available to us that could help you accelerate your results with whatever dietary approach you follow and these two tools they're free and they are love and gratitude now when i say love i mean self-love looking at yourself in the mirror, saying, thank you, I love you to yourself, looking at yourself in the eyes, having affirmations of I love myself, I love myself. These are things that I do to this day. And then loving other people, especially those people who have done bad things to you and have hurt you. And I know that sounds very difficult and and sometimes impossible to some people, but but here's the truth. We get what we feed energy to. That's a universal law. Like whatever you feed energy to expands. 
and our thoughts, we could have a negative thought about somebody. So we're feeding energy to that. And that comes back to us because the thoughts are like a boomerang. So having hate towards somebody comes back to us, prevents us from healing. So when we heal ourselves by loving ourselves and then forgiving others and loving other people, we then heal. Because when you have resentfulness and hatefulness for somebody else, it's impossible to heal. The second thing is gratitude. Uh, I believe whatever we appreciate, appreciates. And we, there's so much to be grateful for. The fact that you know I'm communicating with you, Connie, you're in a different state. I'm in Florida, you're in Idaho, and we're able to have a conversation to impact other people. That's something to be grateful for. The fact that 150,000 people die every single day and we're alive, that's something to be grateful for. But gratitude is so important. So something that I've done every single night before bed and in the morning when I wake up, I write down what I'm grateful for. 10 things before bed, 10 things in the morning. I have notebook after notebook of just gratitude because like I said, what we appreciate appreciates and what we think about and think about we bring about. And that goes back to the brain. We talk about the brain. There's a part of the brain called the reticular activation system, which stands for RAS. I'm going to call it RAS for short. The brain is a selective seeking mechanism. It just wants you to survive. Number one priority for the body is survival. So the RAS is like this. So for example, when the analogy I'm going to give is this, let's say you want to buy a red Mustang, right? and you are shopping on autotrader.com, you're going to the dealership, you're looking for red Mustangs, and then you finally buy this red Mustang, you're driving it home, you're so happy, and you look on the road and you see a red Mustang right next to you at the red light, you see a red Mustang down the street, and you're wondering, why am I seeing all these red Mustangs? Did everybody buy a red Mustang the same day that I bought it? What the heck? The truth is this, they were always there, but you've activated this RIS to see all red Mustangs. So when you're thinking about things that are not working for you, you're complaining, you're, you're gossiping, you're going to get more things to complain about, more things to gossip about. But the opposite is true. When you're focusing on gratitude, when you're focusing on your goals, you're going to get more of what you do want. And that is a universal law. So it's so important to do this work while you're eating better, while you're doing the fasting, while you're doing the exercise. And that's true holistic health right there. I love everything that you just said there. I have seen so many people that their thoughts are toxic and you see that manifest in their health and their body composition and their sleep and their everything, gut health, hormones, you name it. So that's a, a wonderful thing. And I love the way that you just said that right there. <laughs> Thank you, Connie. I'm glad you, that resonated with you. Yeah, it was great. I was like, okay, what, what, what per, part am I putting in your video clip here? Cause this is awesome. <laughs> so uh, anyway, yeah. So I, you know, and so let's talk about sleep a little bit, Ben, because I feel like there's a lot of people out there that are really struggling with their circadian rhythms, their sleep patterns. There's the people that think they can sleep when they're dead. They overdo it. They're super busy. And I think that people don't realize how important sleep is. And I know with my own clients, it's been kind of a balance because somebody will be like, well, I haven't been sleeping well or something, or I've been busy working and I, and I'm always like, well, don't work out. And that blows their mind. But I'm like, listen, if you're trying to get healthy and we're trying to work on all of these things, the last thing you need to do after not sleeping is go and throw another major stressor at your body. So let's talk about sleep a little bit. What's your take on that? You're doing your clients some good. Absolutely. I love that you do that for them. I, I would say the same thing. When I used to own my CrossFit gym, I used to see athletes come in and they would overtrain. I would ask, Hey, how's your sleep? Oh, you know, I don't sleep so good. I'm waking up early to do the 5 a.m. class. I'll, I'll, be, I'll say, Whoa, whoa, whoa. That, that's not the way it works. You should not sacrifice sleep to exercise. You should get sleep and then exercise should be the bonus because exercise, first of all, is important, but it's a poor way to lose weight. You don't do exercise to lose weight. You do exercise to build muscle mass, you build exercise for brain health, you build exercise for other reasons other than weight loss. Sleep is the foundation of health. It is the, the, the pinnacle of you getting results because if your sleep is crap, but you're doing keto perfectly, fasting perfectly, exercise perfectly, it doesn't matter how much you do. Your health will fall apart wall by wall if that foundation is not solid. And sleep is one of those foundations. So is the thoughts that I spoke about, the gratitude, movement, over-exercise, um, and so on and so forth. So what happens with sleep is a lot of amazing things happen. First of all, your, most of your fat burning hormones are activated during delta sleep, stage four sleep. So you have testosterone, 
insulin like growth factor one. You have the brain also, the brain is shrinking in size, literally the brain shrinks in size. And then you have this fluid that flushes over the brain called the glymphatic system and it's flushing out toxins. And then during REM sleep, you're taking short-term memory, processing it for long-term memory. So it's helping with your mental clarity, it's helping with your energy. And I just recently did a video where I was breaking down what sleep, what sleep deprivation does. And there was a couple of studies, studies that I was looking at. Scientific American had, had the studies and it showed that if you're getting less than five hours of quality sleep each night, the following morning, you're going to have higher levels of cortisol, which is your stress hormone to your point why you shouldn't want to exercise with poor sleep. You're also going to have higher levels of glucose because gl cortisol goes up, glucose follows. So it could even knock you out of ketosis without eating higher levels of ghrelin. Ghrelin is a hunger hormone that makes you want to go eat and lower levels of leptin, which is your satiety hormone. So you're going to be hungrier. And then when you do eat, you're not going to be as satisfied because you're going to want to eat more. And it depletes your willpower, depletes your decision-making capabilities, all because you're not getting good sleep. So sleep is crucial. I, I, it's important for us to get at least seven hours of quality sleep every single night. You know, I'll give your audience some tips here. I wrote a book about sleep, by the way. And some of the tips in there is to keep your bedroom cold. About 65 degrees Fahrenheit is where study shows a good sweet spot. Dark as possible, whether you're wearing a sleep mask or using blackout curtains. Taking a hot shower about an hour before bed could be good. Drinking like a banana tea where you boil the peel of a banana and put that water into a cup could help. Um, taking some like reishi mushroom extract or some chamomile tea. Having a nighttime routine is key and it's going to really help with your results overall. Absolutely. I was just speaking with someone about this the other day, actually he's saying they couldn't wind down for bed. And I just said, well, after you get your kids to bed, take a nice warm bath. Yep. read, do something to disconnect your brain and get it prepared for sleep mode. Great advice. Exactly. You want to have a nighttime routine and that's a perfect thing to do right there. You're, you're uh, telling you, like, like you said, a lot of people are, are, are saying I'll sacri I'll sleep when I'm dead. You know, YOLO, you only live once. And that's a very typical entrepreneur mindset. I used to have it myself, but I got news for you. If you are in that philosophy of I I'll sleep when I'm dead, you're going to get there sooner than you'd like, because one of the things that happens is you, there's something in our cells called telomeres, which studies show when you measure telomeres, the longer you are, typically the longer you're going to live, the healthier you are, but the shorter they are, the more susceptible you are to disease. So the, the, I compare like telomeres to the end of like a shoelace, you have that tiny little plastic casing. If that begins to shorten and then eventually go away, the shoelaces begin to fray and it becomes a problem. It'll trip you up. Well, if the telomeres begin to fray, it damages your DNA and then it triggers bad genes and it leads to inflammation. One of the quickest ways to shorten your telomeres is to get poor sleep. So you're actually aging faster. You're storing onto body fat. It's just all bad things. Yes, I 100% agree with you on all of the things sleep right there. So let's kind of circle back here just a little bit. Uh, so as far as the keto flexing approach, uh, at what point should people start to incorporate carbs? And is there a way that you recommend they go about doing that? Yeah. So I'll give you some general answers in my book. It's going to be, I'm going to have more detailed answers, more specific to the person and their goals and their health history. I would say after it's about 60 days, um, you could start flexing. So 60 days of being strict, being in ketosis, doing some intermittent fasting, you could start flexing. And, and the, the best way to do it is what I, with the five, one, one rule, uh, I'll break that down. It's a seven day approach, five days out of the week, which is the five and the five, one, one, five days out of the week, you're doing keto, you're eating keto foods. You're doing your intermittent fasting schedule. I like an 18, six, one day out of the week, you're doing a 24 hour fast where you're going dinner to dinner. You're getting more autophagy studies show a 24 hour fast could actually reboot intestinal stem cells as well. You're getting more autophagy, more fat loss, autophagy, cellular repair, cellular cleanup. That's the one in the 511. And then the other one in the 511 is a keto flex day. And how, you, how that works is no fasting. You have your breakfast, you have your lunch, you have your dinner. You're going to increase your total carbohydrates to around 100, 150. You're also going to increase your protein and then you're going to lower your fats. It's important though to have healthy carbohydrates, have fruits, have yam, yuca, sweet potato, some ancient grains, 
And if you've done this the right way, the next day or the next two days, within 48 hours after the flex day, you should be right back into ketosis. And that is true metabolic freedom and flexibility. I love that. That's great. Well, you have a lot of information. You have um, stuff all over social media, YouTube. You said you have another book coming out. If my listeners want to find you, where do they go about doing that? Yeah, thank you. Um, the best place to find me, my YouTube channel is pretty good. Uh, we release two brand new videos a week at least. So youtube.com slash keto camp and camp is spelled with the K. And then you could also check me out on the Keto Camp Podcast, two new episodes a week on Keto Camp Podcast, which is available everywhere. And then I'm all over social media, Clubhouse, Instagram. You could just look me up. Uh, ben Azadi is my name and you'll, I'll pop right up. Awesome. I love it. I just started trying the clubhouse thing. I'm not sure how good I'm doing at it yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, oh, it's a, a learning curve, but anyway, it's a learning curve. Yeah. Me it's and fun. technology, we are not really friends. So we do our best though. So it, it worked out today. The internet worked out today. I know. I'm so excited for that. And so Ben, I'm so thankful that you decided to join me and share some of your information as well as your journey. I will make sure and put all of your information in the show notes as well so that my listeners can go and find you and look more into your stuff. Thank you so much, Connie. You're doing great work. So kudos to you and great interview today. Thank you. Likewise, I'm appreciative of everybody out there in the health community trying to help people make changes in their life. Amen. Let's continue doing it. Whoop, whoop.